Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I tell you, you know, when we had that time of prayer, I'd encourage everyone when we pray for people like that, pray for them like you would if it was your brother, yeah. or your sister, or your son, your daughter, your mother, or your father, because it is somebody's. And we would uh, uh, really appreciate others praying for us if we were in that situation. Amen. So. You know, I know you may not remember every name, but just during the week, say, Lord, I just want to bring it before you. We're just standing. We're believing. And uh, we shall see the victory. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. And I tell you, what a testimony when you see people healed. You know, our very own Pat Parson yeah. was healed of stage 4 cancer. So that's not a death sentence. You know, God's power can and will prevail. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. And also, let's continue to remember uh, Lloyd and Jean in, in prayer as well. Um, you know, I mean, that's just kind of an ongoing prayer. Uh, uh, you know, Lloyd is doing okay, but he's you know he's weak. You know, he's weak, and of course he is in his mid 90s, and you know the day's going to come when he's going to go home. And we understand that, but I just want to pray that he'll have the best quality of life until that day comes. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. All right. Although I did an age test, you ever see those? I don't do many of them, but I, for some reason I did this one. And so I'm going to live to be 124, so I'm all right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, we're going to talk today about the subject, fighting for the faith. Fighting for the faith. In case you're not aware of it, Christianity is under attack. Of course, that's nothing new. It's been under attack from day one. However, in my lifetime, or even in the last five years through the last decade, I've seen an increase in the caliber of attack that is being brought upon us. And if we do not defend the faith, if we do not stand for the Word of God, and if we do not plead for people to follow the principles of God's Word, who will? We believers have a responsibility to contend for the faith. God has left it up to you and to me to carry out His plan for this earth. It's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? I think angels probably could do a better job. Mm -hmm. But He didn't choose the angels. He chose us to carry out His plan. He entrusted you and me to carry out His plan on this earth. If you would, I'd like to ask you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm sorry, Jude chapter 6. 1 verse 3 first. Then we're going to look at 1 Timothy 6.12. And it reads in Jude chapter 1 and verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. <coughs> then in 1 Timothy chapter 6 in verse 12 Paul writing to young Timothy he says fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession. Thank God for the good confession. Amen. Amen. Have you made the good confession of faith? Have you asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart? And that's great. Amen. If you haven't, you shall have an opportunity today to do that. And he confessed a good, faith, a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 
I want to ask you a question. Do you think that the Bible is written for you today? I mean, are these verses of Scripture for you? Or are you just supposed to attend church every once in a while, or maybe even every Sunday, and call it good? Well, I'm a Christian and I go to church every Sunday. That's good enough. That's all that's expected. I believe the Bible is, is speaking to believers today. Amen. I believe that's obvious if you read it and understand it. And I believe we're told to do something. We are told to contend, to defend, and to fight for the faith. If we are told indeed to do those things, <clears throat> my question is this morning, why are there not very many believers doing it? If we're told to fight for the faith, and there aren't very many believers fighting for the faith, why? Well, that's what I want us to look at this morning. And I have six reasons. And everybody have an outline, I hope? Okay. <clears throat> Number one, <clears throat> some believe that it doesn't really matter. After all, God is in control. That's what some believe. First of all, we need to understand God is not in control. Now, I know that ruffles the feathers of some folks. But I believe after you hear what I have to say, you'll understand what I mean when I say God's not in control. That's a very popular saying as well. God's in control. God's in control. God's in control. Also, you may want to go back and, and look at some of the teachings I've already done. God's not in control. It's a good, it's a good title because you know, I guess people want to look at it. What do you mean God's not in control? We watched, the youth and I, watched a movie uh, a week ago Friday called God's Not Dead. Awesome movie. It really was. I really liked the movie. However, the God is in control mentality was kind of sprinkled throughout the show. Actually, that's one of the reasons so many of the people had a hard time with God is because they believed that God was the one that caused the cancer. They believed that God was the one that was uh, uh, causing kids to starve to death in Africa. And that's... That's a big deal when you talk to a non-Christian. I do not want to serve a God who caused my Aunt Lily to get cancer and suffer and die. You can kind of understand that a little bit, can't you? You see, church, if God is in control, then it must be His will for all these things to happen. I mean, if I'm controlling things... That means things are going my way, right? If I'm in control and I'm controlling it, then that means I intend for that to happen. That's my will for that to happen. However, let's put it this way. If God's in control, all these evil things are meant to happen. But if God's in control, are they really evil things? I mean, can it be evil if God's, if it's God's will, you know, His ways are higher than our ways and we don't understand the ways of God. And, and you've heard all these sayings before, amen? When somebody's suffering like that, well, we don't know why God's putting you through this. and You know, He, he won't put you through more than you can handle. And, and besides that, that's nowhere in the Bible. Really, it isn't. You know, it says we, we won't be tempted above what we can withstand. It has nothing to do with God putting us through stuff. That's talking about temptation. And there's no temptation that we can't overcome. Amen? Amen. I mean, otherwise, in other words, the devil can't make you do something. If God gave the devil complete power, then, you know, he, you know, I mean, he did put some limitations. Now, let me say this. Why is God not in control? 
Because God gave us free will. You can't have it both ways. You can't have God in control of everything and you having free will. If God gives you free will, then He's not controlling everything. Now, God's powerful enough. He could control everything, but then He would be going against His plan to give man free will. Amen? There's so much I could say, but we can't go there today. But there are some teachings that, that we have available if you would like to go back and, and listen to those. So, kids starving in Africa. You know why they're starving in Africa? Because we are letting them starve in Africa. There, is, there are enough resources in this world that kids would not have to be suffering in Africa. It's not God's fault. It's our fault. People are dying of cancer because sickness came into the world along with sin because man disobeyed God and committed high treason against God in heaven and therefore sin came into the world and death through sin, both physical and spiritual. Scripture tells us that Satan is God of this world and it tells us in John 10.10 10, the thief does not come but to steal, kill, and to destroy. Now on the bright side, God will take those things that Satan meant for harm and many times turn that situation around and make good out of it. But that's why some people say, well, you know, God just had a plan. No, uh, we messed up God's plan and He can't help us out anyway. Last week I talked about how in the last days certain things would happen. And we shouldn't be shocked or we should not become bitter. We should not let it rob us of our peace. But at the same time, I said, don't throw in the towel. Don't just give up. We are told to occupy until He comes. In other words, we're not supposed to just sit back and assume that everything that is happening is God's will and do nothing about it. We are to continue to fight and to pray. We're to stand up for righteousness. We're to fight for the faith. We're to defend the Word of God. I believe in the Bible. I believe it's God's Word. And it's written for us. I believe it is just as true today as the day it was first penned. So church, let's not just say, well, God's in control. Okay, sarah, sarah. Let it be, let it be. No. God's will is not always done. Amen? Secondly, some believe that their relationship with God is private and it's not anyone else's business. Have you ever heard someone say that? I do not talk about my relationship with God because it's private. It's between me and God. And church, that is totally unbiblical. In Acts chapter 1, in verse 8, it reads there, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Why do we need power if we're going to keep it private? And better yet, how are we going to be witnesses if we keep it private? If it's just between God and me? just doesn't even make sense. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. It reads there, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. Now, does everybody understand what that word reconcile means? That means to bring together. Okay? So, God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. Listen to this. These are shouting words here. I mean, this is going to make Mark want to shout hallelujah. 
not imputing their trespasses to them. Yes. In other words, not counting your sin against you. <coughs> That's shouting words for all of us, isn't yeah. it? And, now here, here's the responsibility part. And has committed to us, you and me, the word of reconciliation. In other words, God has given us His word to bring people into a relationship with Him. Because when Adam sinned, he separated mankind from God. Now mankind has to be brought back to God one at a time. And He's committed that word of reconciliation to you and me. It's our job. It's our responsibility. It's our ministry to bring people back to God through Jesus Christ. What's private about that? There's nothing private about that. Amen? Amen. And let me just throw the rest of it in because it's good. Well, he goes on to say, Now then, listen, we are ambassadors for Christ. Have you ever heard of a private ambassador that keeps it private? We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. How can He plead through us if we're just keeping it between Him and me? We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And church, that ought to be our message. I implore you to be reconciled to God. I beg of you to come know Jesus Christ. Because church, if you don't come to know Jesus Christ, you will spend an eternity in hell. Now I know that's not politically correct. But it's the truth. And we can go around baby people and let them go straight to hell or we can stand up, defend the faith, speak the truth, and hopefully snatch them out of the flames of hell. Because it's real. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And one of my favorite verses right here, for He who... For He made Him who knew no sin, Jesus, to be sin for us. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Hallelujah. Church, that's the best news you could ever hear. Jesus became sin for you so that you might become righteous. You've heard me say this before. We're not all just sinners saved by grace. I was a sinner. I was saved by grace. But the Word of God tells me right there that I am now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. I'm righteous not because of anything I've done except to accept Him. To accept the free gift of salvation. And that makes me righteous. I can stand before God now holy and blameless in love. Amen. Because of what He did for me. And that's the message we're called to take out to this world. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He, he's calling you. He's begging you to come to Him. And if you'll accept His call and receive Him as your Lord and Savior, you too shall be saved. And you will become the righteousness of God in Christ. And you will have a home with Him in heaven for eternity. Hallelujah. That's good preaching. <laughs> How can we be an ambassador for His kingdom if we keep it just between God and ourselves? You can't. Number three, why we do not defend the faith, contend for the faith, fight for the faith. Some believe that Christian acts are enough. This really piggybacks number two, it's a private matter. Well, I live like a Christian, and that's how I witness to others by my lifestyle. Yes, we should act like Christians. Actually, we shouldn't act like Christians, we should be Christian. <coughs> but you understand what I'm saying when I say act. In other words, live like what you are. The righteousness of God in Christ. Amen? Yeah. Let me just take a little turn here for a moment. I saw this verse the other day and it just really spoke to me. The times that we're living in. Ephesians 4, 
29 through 30. But I'm going to read this out of a New Living Translation. <coughs> kind of breaks it down. Makes it a little bit more understandable. Don't use foul or abusive language. Do I need to interpret that? Don't use foul or abusive language. You know, there's, there's this new liberty thing in the church today, and, and some pastors are even encouraged, by I don't know who, but they seem to be encouraged to use foul language from the pulpit just so people feel more comfortable. I have this idea, you're not always supposed to feel comfortable in church. There is still such a thing as conviction, amen? Don't use foul or abusive language. As a believer, we should not use foul language and we should not use abusive language. What, what kind of language should we use? Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Wouldn't the world be a better place? Verse 30. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. We do have a responsibility as believers to live according to what He's made us. We don't do it in our own power. We do it as He empowers us. But at the same time, we do have a part to play. Amen? Amen. He goes on to say, Remember, He has identified you as His own. You know, when my son or daughter go out into the world, in a sense, they're representing me. Matter of fact, remember when David killed all the, all the, the enemy that he killed? What did they ask? Who's his father? I said, Jesse. See, he was representing his father. Another point, as you go out into this world, you're re representing Crosswalk Fellowship. He goes on to say, Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of re redemption. Hallelujah. You know what Christian means? Christ-like. So if we call ourselves a Christian, we need to do our best to act like Christ or be like Christ. Now, if we do not inform people as to why we do what we do, we're not being a witness for Christ. Yes, we should live the life, but if we're not telling them the life that we're living, what really good does it do for the kingdom if they do not know your life is being lived the way it is because you're trusting in Christ as your Savior? To inform people why we do what we do in order to be a witness. You know, we are called to do good works. Not for our salvation, but because we are saved. We're called to do good works. He's created us. For good works. That's what the early Christians were known for. Their good works. Who are these people that are doing all these good works? Oh, they call themselves Christians. What does that mean? They're like their king, Jesus. <coughs> they are like the Christ. You know, the, fa the famous dictum of Francis of Assisi. I didn't say Francis was a sissy. I said Francis of a sissy. <laughs> Preach the gospel at all times. Use words when necessary. That was actually taken completely out of context by Christians who do not want to share their faith. He was actually talking to a group of monks that were in seclusion and, and they taken a vow of silence. And he says, preach the gospel always and use words when necessary. Now there are some that say he didn't even say that. But church, whatever the case may be, by his lifestyle, he was not saying don't preach the gospel of words because that's all he did. We're to do both. We're to preach the gospel with words and we're to live the gospel with our lives. We're to do both. 
The Christian message is to be proclaimed. It is very important that we do not remain silent. We have an open door of opportunity which many here, especially in the States, never take advantage of while there are other people in other parts of the world that are, that are sacrificing their very lives to proclaim this gospel. For the most part here in the States, all that will happen to us if we proclaim is maybe get ridiculed a little bit, at least for the time being. Our religious freedom is not a given. I mean, I'm not trying to be a pessimist. I'm just trying to... You know, we need to wake up and see reality. If we do not stand up and fight, it can be taken away from us. It's already happening in other parts of the world that you would not think about. I mean, I'm not talking Iraq. I'm not talking Iran, but places like France and other European countries. It's now, in France, it's now illegal to evangelize. I had a big, long article I wanted to read to you, but I just don't want to take the time to read this big article. It's in Charisma Magazine a year or so ago. But it is escalating. You cannot witness to children or elderly. that They're putting many, many restrictions in other areas. Uh, you, you can't preach against homosexuality. You can't even have those thoughts. Even if your thought process is wrong on it, you can be arrested and fined in, in some of the European countries. It's even gone over into to, uh, Canada. I mean, while well, I say about your thoughts, you know, your, your doctrine or your beliefs, even if you're not preaching, if, you, if they know that's your doctrine or beliefs, you've got to change them because it's offensive and it's considered hate speech. Does that sound familiar here in the States? Can you not see it escalating? Parents cannot discipline their children by spanking them or even believing that's what you're supposed to do according to the Bible. Now I know that's big in the news today. And church, let me tell you, there's a big difference between spanking and beating. Yes. Let me just say this while we're on the subject. Since it is a hot topic right now. If you have anger issues, don't spank your kids. I know our rule was you can never spank when you're angry. So if I was angry, sure I would give them a spanking. If she was angry, I would give them a spanking. A spanking consisted of no more than three swats on the rear end. Let me tell you, there was never enough to leave a mark. If you have children that have issues, don't spank. But for the normal child, it's not called beating, it's called discipline. Now, I've seen the product of many kids who had no spankings. I think Dr. Spock did us all a disservice. Matter of fact, I think he went back and, and, and later said, hey, I was wrong. I don't think he even had any kids whenever he wrote that book, if I remember right. A little swat or two on the rear end for correction never hurt a kid. Again, let me qualify that by saying, if you have anger issues, don't do it. Find another way. If your child has certain issues for whatever reason, there, there's, there's reasons not to there as well. But the Bible does tell us that a swat or two is not going to hurt. Amen? Matter of fact, I think it's going to help quite a bit. I know our kids, especially Charity, I don't know if I ever had to maybe spank her a couple times, then I could just look at her. And that was all it took. And Tony didn't take a whole lot more than that. So it wasn't like we had to beat him every day. You just let him know, and, 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 and I'm, getting, I'm going a little bit, spend a little time here, but, but let me tell you the important word here is consistency. I don't know if we got parents in here or not with young kids. I'm not really looking around thinking about anybody in particular. But I'm just saying this because I believe it's a fact. If you say you're going to do it, do it. I mean, that is 
what makes the difference is consistency. They know a kid will do, a kid's a kid, they'll do what they know they can get by with. I mean, I've seen parents, you do that one more time, you do that one more time, you do that one more time, and after about the 15th time, they get so angry they just beat the kid. You see, that's not the correct way of administering discipline. Amen? We used to have a one, two, three. They do something, that's one. They do it again, that's two. If we got the three, they got a whack. Okay, I guess this is not a lesson on child discipline. But it is. And I'm not trying to say we did everything perfect, but we did do a few things right. I'll tell you, our kids would sit out in the pews. We had pews back in those days. And they started acting up. Cheryl or I, all we had to do was look at them. And they knew to straighten up. Because it only took one time to stop at the whole service. Excuse me. Walk down, take them back to the bathroom. Swat, swat, swat. Come back in. That's all it took. Because, see, they thought at one time they could get by with it because they're there all by themselves. We're up on the platform. But as soon as they learned it didn't matter that we were on the platform, that we would stop everything to take care of that situation right then and there, you just look at them. And that was it. They knew. If I keep doing this, I'm going to get a spanking. All right. Enough of the child-rearing lessons. <laughs> Where were we? Okay. Uh, I really don't know where we were. Uh, number four. Some believe that a Christian should not get involved in politics or government. Some folks consider politics worldly and a Christian is to be in the world but not of the world. And that's true in itself, but it's an incorrect assumption that Christians are not to be involved in politics or government. Government is people's ideas concerning what rules everyone lives by. And it's kind of ridiculous that God would not want believers involved in that process. Amen? Yes. If we're going to fight for the faith, we need to have believers placed in positions of authority and policy-making decisions. I truly believe that if more Christians would make a stand, and, and you know why there's not more godly uh, men and women in, poly, in the government? It's because believers are not standing up for righteousness. They're standing up for their own selfish reasons, and they're not putting godly people in positions of authority that will seek God and make godly decisions. I truly believe that if more Christians would make a stand, we would create a positive influence upon society. And church, future opportunities of spreading the gospel may very well depend upon that. That's true. Number five. Some believe prayer is enough. If we just pray, God will take care of it. Yes, we should and we must pray. But we're supposed to put feet to our prayers. Amen? The apostles and Christ's disciples prayed, but they also evangelized. Many times at great cost and sacrifice, they went out and proclaimed the Word of God. They were told to stop preaching Christ. And they said, we would obey God rather than man. How many Christians today do you believe would continue to witness and proclaim the gospel if they were told they would be put in jail? No, most Christians won't even proclaim the gospel if they think they're going to be laughed at. God never intended for us to be monks. To stay in our rooms in seclusion. We have been called 
to action after prayer. Number six, final point. And this is kind of taking a turn, but I believe it's necessary to bring it up. Some believe in unity in the church at all costs. These are the reasons we don't stand up and fight, contend for, and defend the faith. Some believe in unity in the church at all costs. Now, I believe unity in the house of God is very important. I really do. However, not at all costs. There are some deal breakers. One of which is salvation. How we are saved. Jesus said, He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father except through Him. Yes, Christianity is very narrow-minded. As a matter of fact, that's the one thing over in France that they, they say you can't do. You can't say that Jesus is the only way that is hate speech and you will be put in jail if you do it. Church, we're not that far behind France. How are we saved? The Bible tells us we're saved by placing our trust in Christ. If someone is saying otherwise, we cannot have Christian unity with them because they are not a Christian. That's not hate speech. That's love speech. I mean, I can sit here and, and uh, uh, humor you and say, oh, isn't that wonderful that you are following uh, uh, Islam or you're following uh, whatever outside of Christianity. Isn't that wonderful? You know, there are many paths that lead to the same summit. No, they're not. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one. Any other way. It's not love to go along with somebody so that you don't offend them. Love is to stand up and take it like a man or a woman and say, there's only one way. And if you do not trust in Jesus, the Bible tells us for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son so that whoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. He who believes is not condemned, but he who believes not is condemned already. As many as believed is not condemned. Church, it's only through Christ. And we're not doing anybody any favors by being politically correct and saying anything other than Jesus is the way. We have an obligation to defend the faith. To expose erroneous doctrines that affect people's salvation. I don't think we have to stand up and fight every belief. But when it comes to serious beliefs of that matter, we better stand up. And we better defend it. Because it's that important. Life and death. Eternal life and death depend upon whether or not a person believes and accepts and knows I said and accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? I cannot preach a message like this without stopping to give an opportunity. This morning, do you know that you are a believer? By that do I mean, do you know that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you cannot say that with certainty, you can know today that you have a relationship with Him. You can know today that Jesus Christ is your Savior. How do I do that, Pastor? You do that by just opening up your heart and saying, Lord, I want You in my life. I want You in to take the lead in my life. If you have never done that and you would like to do that today, I want to ask you to just look at me and just raise your hand. Be bold. Proclaim Him this morning as your Savior. I know the majority, if not everyone in this room, has done that. And there's no shame in lifting your hand. There's no shame in standing up and saying, I believe. If that's you this morning, 
I'm going to ask you just to lift your hand and say, that's me. I, I, I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure I have a relationship with Jesus, but I want to know today. And, and, and friend, if you're not sure, there's a good chance you do not have that relationship. Because, when, you know, I, 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 I'm sure I'm married to this lady right here. You can look at her if you want. I'm sure I'm married to her. I can tell you the day I got married to her. It was a Saturday, April 14, 1984. Now, you know, you may not be able to tell the exact date and time you accepted Christ, but you know there was a time that you did that. And you know you're a Christian because of that. And if you don't know that there was a time in your life you made a decision to come into a relationship with Jesus, then you probably don't have a relationship with Jesus. And you need a relationship with Jesus. You need it. You must have a relationship with Jesus. Because if you leave this earth, whether it's through death or through uh, uh, you know, the rapture coming, well, you ain't going to leave them right away anyway. <coughs> you must have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's important. You know, that's the most important decision you'll ever make. Every other decision is temporary. But that decision to accept Christ is eternal. So I want you to think about it. And I want you to know this. If at any time you want to talk more about it, I'm available. That's, that's the main reason I'm here to be available for spiritual decisions like that. I want you to know I'm available and I'll be glad to talk to you further about it. If, you know, if you're sitting here going, you know, I think I ought to do that, but I'm just not really sure if I should do that. Or I want to do that, but you know, I don't want to stand up or to raise my hand in front of all these people. I'll be glad to sit down with you and talk to you further. Amen? Now, once you make that decision, man, it's a joy to proclaim it in front of people. I'm a believer. I'm on my way to heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. And there's so much more that goes along with that once you know. And I want every one of you to know. And I don't want everybody in my church to be saved, and I want them to get saved. What I mean by that is I want unbelievers coming in and getting saved. Amen. But once they come here, I want them to get saved, and I want them to go out and tell others about Christ. You know, we do talk about these things in church, and we need to, but you know, really... You guys are the ones that need to be going out there telling people about Christ and bringing them back and saying, hey, Johnny made a decision for Christ. Amen? And we'll just rejoice in that decision. We'll take time to disciple them. Help them understand the Word of God. Encourage them. Pray for them. I mean, isn't church a neat thing? Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. God bless you. Have a wonderful week, and uh, we look forward to seeing you, if not before, next Sunday. God bless you.